ways, Mary, you know, and Mary's the great mother, right? That she's the mother. That's what Mary is. Whether she existed or not is not the point. She exists at least as a hyper-reality. She exists as the mother. Well, what's the sacrifice of the mother? Well, that's easy. If you're a mother, and you, if you're a mother who's worth her salt, you offer your son to be destroyed by the world. That's what you do. I mean, that's what's going to happen, right? He's going to be born. He's going to suffer. He's going to have his trouble in life. He's going to have his illnesses. He's going to face his failures and catastrophes, and he's going to die. That's what's going to happen. And if you're awake, you know that, and then you say, well, perhaps he will live in a way that will justify that. And then you try to have that happen. And that's what makes you worthy of a statue like that. But still the sacrifice of the mother. Is it right to bring a baby into this terrible world? Well, every woman asks herself that question. Some say no, and they have the reasons. Mary answers yes, voluntarily. Mary is the archetype of the woman who answers yes to life voluntarily. That's what that image means. And not because she's blind. She knows what's going to happen. And so she's the archetypal representation of the woman who says yes to life, knowing full well what, what life is. Not naive, not someone who got pregnant in the backseat of a 1957 Chevy, you know, in one, in a <laughs> one night of, 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 of half-drunk idiocy. Not that, but consciously, consciously knowing what's to come. And then also allows it to happen, because that's another thing that's a testament to the courage of mothers. And my mother was good at this. My mother's a very agreeable person, too agreeable for her own good. But that's what happens if you're agreeable, because you're too agreeable for your own good. That's the definition of agreeable. And so she's a nice person, and still is. Luckily, she's still alive, and we've had a very good relationship, and I have always been able to make her laugh, which is, which is a good thing. And, but she was tough, cookie, that woman, you know. If, if uh, remember once she came across, I was out playing in this baseball diamond, little diamond, and empty lot, really, in this little town I grew up in. And I was about 10, and she walked by. I was there with a bunch of my friends. And I was about to have a fist fight with this little tough kid that I hung around with. And uh, there were half girls on the team, and the fist fight had some relationship to status maneuvering, you know, in relationship to that. Anyways, we were going to have a fight, and my mom walked by, she took a look, and I could see from her demeanor that she knew exactly what was about to happen, and she looked for a second, and then she walked by, and I thought, whoa, good work, mom. No kidding, eh? It's like the last bloody thing I needed at that moment was for her to come charging up and say, you boys aren't planning to have a fight, are you? It's like, well, yeah, Mom, we're, we were actually planning to have a fight, and now that you came and intervened, I actually lost before the goddamn thing even started. <laughs> so, two thumbs up for Mom. She was also the person that said, because I had some trouble with my dad when I was, a ke you know, an adolescent, he had some trouble with me, so, you know, with a <laughs> It was 50-50, that's for now, it's probably 70-30 with me on the 70 end of the being the trouble. And anyways, I left home when I was about 17, and uh, she said something really interesting when I left home. She said, if it was too good at home, you'd never leave. I thought, hey, Mom, that's pretty good, you know, for, for an agreeable person, you've got a real spine, man. So that was pretty good. So... So, you know, mother, that says this, the mother is the person who also says, get out there, take your goddamn lumps, because you're tough enough so that you can handle it. She doesn't say, you just stay down there in your bedroom, brooding away, because the world is unfair and treating you badly, and your suffering is too much. She says, yeah, there's a lot of suffering out there, but you're a hell of a lot tougher than you think you are. So... In turn, Mary's son, Christ, offers himself to God so completely that his faith and trust in the world is not broken by betrayal, torture, or death. That's the model for the honorable man. So, 
you know, you have an interesting dynamic there. You have the woman who's willing to make the sacrifice lays the groundwork for the son who is willing to make the sacrifice. That works out pretty nicely, and it's a good thing to know. In Christ's case, however, as he sacrifices himself, God, his father, is simultaneously sacrificing his son, right? That's one of the oddities of the Trinitarian model, is that God sacrifices himself to himself. Same thing happens in Norse mythology, right? Um, is it Norse? It's Zeus, Germanic mythology. Zeus sacrifices himself to himself. He actually hangs on a tree. He's actually wounded in his side. It's a very interesting parallel. But I think part of the idea is, well, the human, the human race is trying to work out, well, what, what's the ultimate sacrifice? It's something like that, the ultimate sacrifice of value. Well, the, 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 the passion story, and I told you I was foreshadowing, I'm bringing into consideration things we won't talk about for a long time, maybe not at all in this lecture series, I don't know, because I don't know how far I'll get, is that well, there's a supreme sacrifice demanded on the part of the mother, and there's a supreme sacrifice demanded on the part of the son, and there's a supreme sacrifice demanded on the part of the father, all at the same time. And then that makes the supreme sacrifice possible, and hypothetically, that's the one that renews. That's the sacrifice that renews and redeems. It's a hell of an idea, man. And the thing about it is that I don't know if it's true, but I know that its opposite is false. And generally, the opposite of something that's false is true. It's, it's opposite is false is because if the mother doesn't make the sacrifice, then you get the horrible Oedipal situation or something like that in the household, which is just its own absolute catastrophic hell. And if you want a really good insight into that, I would say watch the documentary Crumb. C-R-U-M-B, a man, that's been rated by some critics as the best documentary ever made, and it is some piece of work, man. It is the only thing I've ever seen that actually lays out the Oedipal catastrophe in its full nightmare, you know. So you could, you could look at that. So if the maternal sacrifice isn't there, then that doesn't work. If the paternal sacrifice isn't there, you know, if, you're, if the father isn't willing to put his son out into the world, let's say to be broken and betrayed and all of those things, then... That's a non-starter because the kid doesn't grow up. And then if the son isn't willing to do that, well, then who the hell is going to shoulder the responsibility? So if those three things don't happen, then it's cataclysmic, it's chaotic, it's hell. If they do happen, is it the opposite of that? Well, you could say, well, maybe it depends on the degree to which they happen. And, and it's a continuum. How thoroughly can they happen? Well, we don't know, you know, because you might say, how good a job do you do of encouraging your children to live in truth, let's say? Well, that's part of the answer to this question. And the answer likely is, well, not, you don't do as good a job of it as you could. So it works out quite well, but you don't know how well it could work if you did it really well or spectacularly well or ultimately well or something like that. You don't know. And, you know, people have an intimation of this because one of the things that's really cool about having a young baby this is something you don't know till you have it. There's two things you don't know. Mm. There's a lot more than two. <laughs> There's three things you don't know until you have a baby. The one is that you didn't grow up yet. Because you actually don't grow up until someone else is more important than you. You can't. So people think they grow up if they don't have children, but they don't. They just think they do. Now, there are some people who make sacrifices of other sorts, but this is a whole different ball of wax, as far as I'm concerned. It's not a very elegant metaphor, but... Um, <laughs> you learn that it's kind of a relief, relief not to be the center of attention. That's cool, that you can sit back. Because, of course, your child in your family and in society is immediately the center of attention. And so, unless you're narcissistic, then you allow that to happen. And then you learn all sorts of really good things about other people, because other people really like babies. It's so cool. I lived in Montreal when we had our first child, and I lived in a pretty rough neighborhood, by Montreal standards, right? It's like, <laughs> you know, Montreal is such a great city, like Toronto. It's like even the rough neighborhoods are, they're more like charming, with a little, you know, dark underbelly, something like that. But there were some rough characters in our neighborhood, and it was pretty poor, and we'd we'd uh, push her around in her stroller and these like grizzled, wrecked old guys would come by and they'd look at her and they'd just light up and they'd come over and like smile at her and you know, you just saw their 
the, the positive element of their humanity just well forth. You have to, there has to be something seriously wrong with you if you don't respond that way to a baby, you know? I mean, that's, that's not good. That's not good. But it was so cool to see these people. You'd kind of give them, generally, you'd sort of walk four feet around them on the street, you know? And yet they were, all of a sudden, all that, the layers that were on them would just fall off and they'd be so, and the babies are sort of like public property, weirdly enough, too. Sort of like pregnant women, you know, because people often treat pregnant women sort of like they're public property, too. I mean, in a positive way. Oh, wow, look, you're going to have a baby, eh? And then, you know, they, they, well, they do all sorts of cute things. So, so, you know, the reason I'm telling you that is because there's a strong impulse in people to note that there's something miraculous about the existence of a new human being. And the miraculous element is all the potential that's there, right? That's all there is there, is potential. And with every birth, there's the potential for something remarkable to be introduced in the world. And, you know, one of the things I've thought, too, is the other thing you don't know is that babies are generic until you have one. And then your baby isn't a generic baby at all. It's like, instantly, it's a person with whom you have a relationship that's closer, perhaps, than any relationship that you've ever had and that you can keep perfect, right? Because most of the relationships you've had already are with people who are screwed up in 50 different ways, and so are you. But here you've got this baby, and like, it be care, but it's not ruined yet. And so, you know, you have this possibility of maintaining this relationship that starts out, that baby really likes you, and generally that continues for quite a long time. And they're two years old and you come home, they're really happy to see you. It's kind of like having a puppy, you know? It's like, they're thrilled when you come home. It's like, how many people are thrilled when you come home, you know? So it's you again. It's like, no, not a little kid. A little kid is thrilled when you come home. And you can keep that going. And so there's this pristine element to the potential relationship between parents and children that's terribly devalued in our society, terribly it's almost as if we're willfully blind to it, and I think it's an absolute catastrophe because there's nothing, there's very little in life that can compare to establishing a proper relationship with, with a child. They make great company if you, if you keep your relationship with them pristine. And so, you know, it's worthwhile, you think, well, and so, so the reason I'm telling you this is because people look at infants and they think, they think this could be the potential savior of mankind. That is what they think. That's how they act. So that's what they think. And the thing is, it's also true. 